the person living on this planet, um, how would you sort of describe the general state of the world? Well, the general state of the world is uh, a planet in what we call overshoot. The, the, the work I do is, is measuring the human impacts on global ecosystems. And in many of the major systems that we examine in our ecological footprint work, it's pretty clear that human beings are using these systems faster than they can regenerate. And so we're degrading them, even as the, the human enterprise increases in scale and its demands. So you have an irresistible force meeting one of those uh, immovable objects in the sense that the planet is needed to sustain us, and yet the growth trajectory that we are on is undermining the very systems that are needed to sustain us. So you've just covered about three questions in there. I'll go up, we can elaborate. Yeah, yeah I know. Um, so so, uh, so wh what are those forces at work? I mean, uh, what is it about the species that, that, that puts us in a, in a, in a predicament where, where our, our our future is at stake? Well, it's a, it's a very good question, and it is indeed a predicament. There are many, many entries to that particular question. I'm a biologist, and so I start always from a biological basis. And humans are like any other species. We are an evolved species. We've had to scrabble up competitively. We've won in the sense that uh, we can now use technology to appropriate more of the world's resources than any other species. So we have two tendencies that are part of our nature. The first is to expand to fill all available habitat and I think the second is to use all available resources. We have the widest geographical range of any advanced vertebrate on the planet. Nothing else really comes close and if you simply look at the fact that we're now drilling for oil five kilometers below the sea surface and then five kilometers below the bottom of the sea, it's just an example of the extremes to which we will go to use up all available resources. So those are two biological compulsions that have enabled us to survive, to evolve to this great pinnacle of success. But in a sense, evolution didn't count on technology, which has taken us one step further. So with the development of uh, fossil fuel-based technologies, we've released us from the negative feedback that would keep a population down. You know, for the first two million years of human history, the population, for all intents and purposes, didn't grow. 99% of the growth has all happened in the last 200 years. And it's because with the release of, from disease, starvation, resource scarcity, that came to us with fossil fuels. We've just expanded, we've, we've filled that mandate of expanding to fill everything up and use all resources, and that's compelling us along. Well, to make matters worse, we've developed what we call a, a cultural paradigm, an economic growth paradigm, uh, based on the idea of infinite technological progress aided and abetted by uh, es essentially unlimited material growth. So now you have nurture, the, the uh, cultural environment encouraging every young person to think that, uh, you know, more is better and bigger is better and, and go out and get all you can and so on and so forth. So you have both the biological compulsion to expand and to consume overlaying with a cultural compulsion uh, to uh, grow and, and uh, you know, fill the planet. We're, we have dreams of occupying the universe. So that is our nature. And it's probably at the root of the major problems that we're confronting. Do you think that's the full picture of our nature? I mean, you're, sp you're, you're speaking of a biological uh, uh, sort of entity as opposed to, it seems what separates humans from other, other, other creatures on mm -hmm. this planet, which also gives us another aspect of self-reflection, which I suppose would be, m might, some people might believe is a spiritual aspect, mm -hmm. which, which allows us, which gives us that extra um, ability to pause. Do you, do, you, do, you, do you have a sort of a, a spiritual angle on, on it as well as a, as a scientific one? Well, I, I, I'm not a religious person. I have a spiritual sense. I, I mean, human beings are obviously endowed with the capacity to stand in awe at a, everything from a, the beautiful shape of a tropical fish to a spectacular sunset. So clearly we have that kind of connection to the environment in which we live. But you see, I like to think of human potential as a piano keyboard. There are some very dark, somber notes down here, and then some very bright, beautiful colors up at the upper end of it. That's the biological range of potential in every single one of us. But culture decides whether you play the dark, somber notes or whether you dabble with the more brilliant colors of the spectrum. 
And unfortunately, we have a culture now which is playing on the dark notes, the competitive notes, the, the idea of individuality, the aggressiveness of, of our species, the growth orientation and all of that. And all of that has come at the expense of community, at the expense of beauty, at the expense of appreciating the world for what it is, and so on and so forth. So it's entirely possible for us to, in a sense, socially construct a different worldview, a different way of approaching life. But the one we've constructed right now is the one that's driving us into the, into the ground, at least destroying the, the biological basis of our own existence. So yeah, the potential's there. But we have to first of all acknowledge that what we have in, sh in place now is a socially constructed reality that is a mismatch with the biophysical conditions of the planet. And if we don't deconstruct that and then recreate, I, I often talk about rewriting our cultural worldview, rewriting our cultural narrative so that it complies with the biophysical realities in which we find ourselves. And that would include taking full advantage of humanity's creative powers, our spiritual powers, our sense of unity with the universe and so on. All of that has been suppressed by the current mechanistic, development-oriented, growth-based, materialist paradigm that simply abolishes all of these higher colors, these brighter colors from the spectrum of cultural behavior. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's good that you mentioned music. It's good that you mentioned all the things, because that's what this project is about. Okay. I don't know if, it, if you even know what this no, project is about. No, I don't. I don't. I I've, been, I've, been, I've, been canvas, I've been getting musicians from around the world, oh, is all, so? all different genres, different um, ethnic tr music traditions, mm -hmm. and they're all doing a version of the same song called Oh World, <laughs> which I'd written <laughs> when so I was in an alternative rock band. Is that so? And I'm interviewing them all and asking their thoughts mm -hmm. on the world, because I want to get the artist perspective. See, I used to be a classical oboe player. You see... <laughs> oh, I played oboe. He's Did a, she's yeah. a classical oh. singer. She's a... She sings. Oh, is that so? I'm a, yeah, I'm a musician. No, I had, my, I had a woodwind quintet. Woodwind quintet. Oh. I was the first oboe of the Vancouver Philharmonic, which was the ranking amateur group a few years ago. I, mm -hmm. Then I got kids and dogs and yeah, responsibilities yeah. beyond my ability to oboe playing, as you know. You have to make your own reeds. It's two hours a day and doing that. Two hours of practice. Day. you got to keep your chops yeah. up. And well, actually, the Vancouver Philharmonic did a version of Old World as well. Did they? They oh, did. There you go. And, and actually, we were going we to ask you later <laughs> to sing a line from the song. We were well, hoping. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, well, that's oh. what, we'll have to do a little bit of the head massage. <laughs> but, but that's what we've been doing. We've been interviewing mm -hmm. musicians. Because uh, what, what, from my point of view, yep. the, the, uh, the merchant, the merchant uh, perspective of the mm -hmm. world has, has taken over. Mm -hmm. uh, where, uh, and I'd like to give voice to the artist, the scientist, mm -hmm. sure. and the spiritualist. Religion and spiritual, you know, everyone has their different takes yeah. on spiritualism. Uh, but, you know, I give voice to all that because as far as I'm concerned, that's what the imbalance mm -hmm. is. So what do you think the responsibility of the individual is in, 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 in internally and externally? Well, yeah, again, it's a very difficult question. It's very hard to do what I'm going to suggest. But the primary responsibility of individuals today is to become self-aware to be conscious of where their ma pattern of thinking comes from, where their lifestyle comes from. What is it that, act, that forces us to act in the way that we do that is ultimately so destructive of family, community, and environment? And uh, th that's a terrific job because, you see, the way the human nervous system is set up is that it acquires the cultural norms into which a person is born. And again, from a biological perspective, that made a great deal of sense. If you were born into a tribe, say, 10,000 years ago, and it was surviving, it was clearly doing something right. So there was a, an advantage to acquiring the patterns of thinking, of hunting, the weaponry, the tools, the, 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 the traditions of that particular tribe and culture. The probability of, of, of acquiring those things and succeeding was higher than doing something extremely radical that hadn't been tested in the real world. So I think we have a natural predisposition to be kind of programmed by the cultural context in which we find ourselves. Now, we have to be conscious that that's the case, so that people who adamantly insist that their way of thinking is the right way of thinking should be aware that they only think that way because they've been exposed to those kinds of ideas. And that same person, in a different context, in a different circumstance, would adamantly feel that this was the right way to think rather than the way they think now. So I think we all have an obligation to be aware of how that comes about and to be open-minded, open to the reality, not the reality, but at least to the possibility that the current way of doing things, given its inordinate degree of destruction, is not necessarily the right way or even the best way. And uh, that's the first responsibility. The second responsibility, once you've reached that degree of self-consciousness and self-awareness, is to become politically engaged in the community and in the culture of which you are a part. 
because if the basic premise of science is correct, that the climate is changing, the atmosphere is, is changing, the seas are acidifying, and so on and so forth. This is a planet in great distress. We are still a subsystem of that planet, and if it goes down, if major ecosystems goes down, they'll take us with us. You know, dozens of previous cultures have collapsed because they did exactly what we're doing now, only they did it regionally, we're doing it globally. So let's wake up to that reality wake up to the fact that we're the first culture ever that actually can know what happened to previous cultures and, and we have the knowledge, we have the intelligence, we have the capacity for forward planning, we have the capacity to extend compassion to other species. These are human qualities that we're not using even to save ourselves. Instead, we're falling into that primitive mode of programmed social construction of a reality that simply doesn't fit and it's killing us. Wow. So, what I'm always curious about is like, is how, how do you, how do you deal with? Uh, I, I imagine I know for myself, it's hard for me sometimes to not feel despair. Uh, the more knowledge I, the more mm -hmm. information I get about what's happening in the world, and, and the more I see that, that there's really there's still that you know I'm on I'm on that side. The mm -hmm. other side, we got way more mass than I do. Uh, how do you deal personally with uh, with? Uh, well, how do I deal with the despair? I don't take all of this personally. I have to say, I mean, I vacillate between totally irrational optimism when I come in contact with wonderful NGOs that are doing terrific things and really capturing the spirit of what needs to happen, and completely rational despair when I deal with normal politicians in the real world who are making the decisions that are taking us down. So it, it's kind of a, an odd situation to, to be in. But all that said, I don't take any of this personally. I have a wonderful life. I've had terrific friends. I've got a wonderful partner. My own life is unfolding as anybody should, I think. And uh, it's what sustains me in, in com you know, moving forward with my own academic work and the work I do around the world, trying to help to stimulate people to make that leap of consciousness into the self-awareness that they can they need to have in order to reconstruct the cultural narrative that we need to survive on this planet. So I, I take great comfort from the fact there does seem to be now the beginnings of a popular groundswell in reaction to the mess that we've got ourselves into. You know, the popular press, because they're so aligned with the mainstream, have poo-pooed and, and put aside the Occupy Wall Street movement. But that's just the thin edge of a very thick wedge. And if there isn't, over the next decade or so, a very positive response uh, toward uh, meeting some of the issues and concerns and demands of that movement, it will evolve into civil insurrection. And the simple reality is that if you look at the great, I was going to use the great revolutions, they're always caused by revolutions, it's, it's, it's a circular thing. Big change happens when people suddenly pass a tipping point of consciousness, of awareness, and take to the streets and force the uh, gatekeepers of the status quo to fling aside those gates or they'll knock them down. And I, I frankly see uh, some countries in the world moving in, in that direction. The United States is one of them, by the way. You know, it's funny. I, I, I know a good communicator went, went up, my, but the next thing that I'm going to ask you, you just immediately go into it. You went into the Occupy movement, and then mm -hmm. you went into how the, 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 the ups, the groundswell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm glad because I said to ask one thing, and you go on, you answer like three or four questions. That's mm -hmm. very eloquent. Um, so, so affecting change uh, mm -hmm. on, a, on, a, on a level. See, I also want this to be an inspiration for activism. Sure. Um, uh, how, how, does, how does a person that feels uh, impotent? In, in, in the face of everything that's going on? How, how do you affect change? Well, impotence is a, sense, a, a form of loneliness to me. I mean, th there can only be strength in unity, and that means getting together with like-minded people. Uh, after all, we're dealing with a situation in which there's just enormous forces in opposition. And if we each isolate ourselves in our own lonely little silos of despair, nothing can come of that. Uh, I, it seems to me one of the greatest inspirations that, that I have is, is recognition that the current crisis, the ecological crisis, the climate crisis, even the social crisis, which, and they're all tied together because they're all causally linked to the same set of beliefs, values, and assumptions. It, it's, it's, we are in a collective crisis. 
that requires collective solutions. Now, this is completely antithetical to everything we hear in the mainstream rhetoric of individualism, market dynamics, and all of that kind of stuff. But the simple reality is that as governments try to offload responsibility onto the individual, you know, the things, shower with a friend, drive one day less to work in your car, and so on and so forth, has almost no effect. We know that from, from measurement. What we need to recognize is that the big ticket items that are going to make change come down from the top but are going to be forced by action from the bottom. You cannot, as an individual, implement the carbon taxes or the capture and trade systems that we need. You can't implement a rapid transit in your city as an individual. These things require mass public support, in fact, public demands, so that the politicians act on behalf of our collective interests. See, for the first time in the history of the human species, I think we can make this statement. My individual self-interest is now aligned with the collective interest of the human family. I cannot survive if everyone doesn't survive, or at least you know, the majority of people on this planet. And if we all try to go it alone, we're doomed for sure. Uh, you can um, imagine the kind of mad scramble there will be if we stick to this idea of individualism or international competitiveness in a situation of declining resource abundance. Uh, there will be resource wars. There's a dozen books now with all sorts of scenarios about how this is going to play out. I think they're right, unless this coming to consciousness occurs on a mass scale around the planet so that people recognize that they will go down with that kind of mentality unless we move together in ways that ensure our economic security, ecological stability, and social solidarity around uh, the, the issues that we need to deal with if we're going to survive as a global culture. I think it's really important to point out that there's nothing unique about the current dilemma. There are many volumes of studies on how previous cultures have gone through similar crises of confidence. Mostly they collapse. The ones that don't collapse are those that have been able to sit down, confront their own demons, the, the beliefs, values, and assumptions at the heart of their existing uh, cultural paradigms and change them. Obviously, if this is getting into, you into trouble, that is a better solution, or at least a better way to try out. And that's what we've got to do. Our current cultural narrative is a self-destructive narrative. It might have been okay or at least relatively harmless in an infinite expanse. But on a small, finite planet that's overcrowded and, and with increasing scarcity, the growth-oriented, competitive, anti-social model of today is, is doomed to fail. Are there any examples of that? You know, my cameraman's long weekend, he went to his cabin, so I'm doing double duty here. Oh. <laughs> so if you don't mind, I'm, everyone's gonna have to get sure. up in that. You know, it seems, I, I, I don't know, I, I, I've studied history a bit, but it seems to me that, that, that culture is uh, have a hard time uh, shifting its, uh, its, uh, its paradigm. Yeah, they do. Cultures have an enormously difficult time doing this. And, and there's, again, a whole variety of reasons. Uh, part of them, biological. People tend to, uh, you see, we have this pretense of rationality. Humans are not a rational species. That's a luxury that we can exercise in academic circles from time to time. But politically, we're an emotional species, even an instinctive species. So once people acquire a certain social status, political power, financial power, or whatever, they react emotionally, not rationally, to anything that would tend to dislodge them from those positions of privilege. So we have an enormous uh, resistance from those with uh, a vested interest in the status quo. As, as we all know, in the United States in particular, uh, major industries and individuals, the Koch brothers, are famous for spending millions of dollars creating misinformation campaigns to disabuse the public of any notion that there may be climate change or that there are ecological problems of other kinds. So this is in defense of their status within the existing culture. They've captured the legislative assemblies of many countries. Um, I've just read recently that in the United States, the financial sector alone has five lobbyists in active activity for every congressman and senator in the U.S. Uh, Congress. So you have a situation where the people who are supposed to be acting for the public 
are now really voicing primarily the concerns and interests of very private interests whose interest is in maintaining the status quo, which is why we have the Occupy Wall Street movement. It's beginning to recognize that the system is completely stacked against ordinary people. Anyway, the bottom line is that uh, in those kinds of circumstances, there will be enormous resistance from people at the top to the point where, historically, the most frequent cataclysmic kind of social change does come from revolution. Now, we, we can do things um, before we get to that point. I happen, I'm not an economist, or at least I'm not a believer in market economics to the extent that a lot of people today are. But I will say this, I think that if we had a true market economy, we'd be better off. For example, a true market economy requires no subsidies. We're subsidizing the oil and gas sector. Why, on God's name, would an intelligent species subsidize among the richest corporations on the planet to uh, continue the kind of destructive energy path that, that, that they're leading us down? Well, get rid of those subsidies is the first step. If we were to do so, and if we were to impose um, a, a proper carbon taxes or a, a carbon cap auction and trading system, the prices of fossil fuel would very rapidly ratchet up. This would have an enormous effect on the structure of the economy. Nobody would produce an automobile that wasn't uh, ten times as, well, five times as fuel efficient as today. We wouldn't have leaky old houses everywhere. We would have people scrambling to do whatever they can to save energy because it's costing them a fortune not to. So just using simple market mechanisms, if we, if we weren't such hypocrites, we talk being a market economy, but we do everything to make sure we're not. We subsidize the wrong things and we make damn sure that we offload the ecological damage costs of production to China or some other place that we don't have to see them. We exploit labor in other countries. Why? To get the cheapest goods possible so we can consume more and more. Well, it's unethical, it's immoral, it's certainly not market economics in the strict sense of the word because a truly efficient market requires that the prices tell the truth about the cost of production, both social and ecological costs. So a great leap forward would be to stop being hypocrites and just have a market economy with the appropriate adjustment to the tax system so that the very poor wouldn't be disadvantaged by the generally rising prices. Now, that would make an enormous difference in terms of our ecological crisis without uh, you know, even raising questions of climate change or anything else. So the, the tools are there to make changes that fall short of revolution. But if we don't use those changes, if we don't implement those kinds of uh, simple policies that would make that kind of progress, there will be riots in the streets. And I think uh, we're seeing evidence of that all over the planet today. Yeah, I want to come back to something you were saying about it, that, that we're not really rational beings, that it's mm -hmm. an illusion. And that uh, you can't necessarily expect change through, through rational no. uh, concepts. Um, and that's that's where that's where this this, this project I try to uh, mm -hmm. get into what, what you might call the spiritual side of things yeah, yeah. as well because what what the point of view of the of a Rinpoche a Buddhist Rinpoche mm -hmm. is that that as you say everything starts mm -hmm. from your perspective and your perspective yeah, yeah. is not your thoughts no. your thoughts are merely a reflection of your perspective in a way that's exactly right so 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 to get to the core of change mm -hmm. how would you describe the core of change because you're, 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 you're describing the practicalities. I understand mm -hmm. that, and, it, and it's, it's a Yeah, it's you're, I, I'm not a, as much a philosopher as you'd like me to be. No, no, <laughs> but, but, uh, but it's, also, it's, also like, it's also like the full person. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's you, you the person. As you as a person, not as a scientist, what's your... What's your um, I mean, maybe you don't feel like an expert, so you don't feel like you should talk about it, mm -hmm. because you're used to being an expert. Yeah. But, but, but really, you are an expert, because you're you, right? So what, what from you, this person that's, that's a very eloquent and brilliant mind, what's your... Um, really nice. <laughs> What's your what's your what's your core to, to, to make this to make this and it also leads into something else which I was gonna ask you is was, was there an epiphany moment in your life where where things shifted noticeably in your consciousness or have you always been the same fellow? Well, you know, uh, in terms it, there was an epiphany moment. In fact it's exactly the word that I used to describe it. And it goes back to my very early youth when I spent a great deal of time on my grandparents' farm in southern Ontario. I was one of eight cousins that were used, I shouldn't say used, that's an inappropriate term, but we were cheap labor on the farm. We all had our assigned tasks, we worked many long hours just about every day. Um, one morning, I guess I was eight, maybe ten years old, uh, my grandmother had a great big open screened-in country porch uh, where we all 
ate our lunch, which by the way consisted of huge piles of just about everything, beef, chicken, everything that we grew on the farm, which really comes to the point. Because we had to wait for my grandfather to come in to say grace. And as I sat there just staring, we were allowed to load our plates up, right? <laughs> Before, but not eat anything. So I had a few minutes to just contemplate everything on my plate. And it struck my 10 year old mind that there wasn't a thing on that plate that I had not been involved in growing. We were completely self-sufficient as a farm. This is in the late 40s, early 1950s. And I don't know why, but that thought struck me in two ways. First of all, I had produced this, and then I realized, no, I haven't produced this. The earth produced this. You know, we say, you are what you eat. As a 10-year-old, I had this enormous insight that I am what I eat, and I am what I eat because I grew what I eat. And it was if the expression I've used is that I'm in an elevator in a free fall as if the floor had fallen out from under me. And I just sank down. I couldn't eat my lunch. I was so excited by this thought of, of complete unity and connection to the earth. Well, <laughs> that sense faded over time. But when I never, I was a, in not a very rich family. I never thought I'd get to university, but I won a scholarship. Now I had to decide what I'm going to do. And uh, that whole thing came back to me. And I knew I had to be an ecologist. I had to come to understand more scientifically the spiritual connection I had felt to the earth. What is the scientific basis of this sense of unity that I had found, this sense of being part of the, the planet? You know, I, I often tell audiences now that yes, many people don't have any of this kind of stuff at all, don't believe in the environment. environment. Okay, so let's say we had this interview again, a year from now, and every, all the audience here showed up. What percentage of them would be here? People look at each other thinking it's a trick question. And somebody finally says, well, if we're all here, it's 100%. And my answer is no, it's 3%. Because your body is a, just a temporary way station for molecules that move through the ecosystem between organisms, between the air, between the waters, and, and so on and so forth. So you're constantly producing yourself out of the food that comes in and the wastes that go out, recycle, and then return to you ultimately. That's what I understood as a 10-year-old kid in a way that most people will never, never understand. And it's driven my whole career. The, the work I've done in, in developing the ecological footprint concept with several good students over the years was entirely coming from that experience on the farm of just wanting to know in greater detail what that uh, connection was and then realizing, of course, in the industrial age that it's gone beyond the pale. We're each of us taking so much that the planet can... can. We're parasites. We've gone from being symbionts, the things that exist in harmony with the, the flow of material and energy through the planet, to being uh, destructive, maladapted, parasitic organisms on the earth. And it's, it's a mind thing. We've got to move back to being unified with our own existence. Cool. Cool. <laughs> You know, it, 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 what you mentioned about, about being a kid and being, having that awareness, my, my memory as a kid is also too. I played in, you played next door and there was always bush next door in Canada, yeah. right? We always had that. Oh, I always did that. You know, but, but nowadays you see kids, they have no sense of, the, of, of nature. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that, um, I think that's a, that's, that's, that's part of the, 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 the decline of, 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 our, of our planet in a mm -hmm. way. Well, I shouldn't say that because I'm sure other countries are not the same, but of Western mm -hmm. civilization is that They've taken away your 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 growing up with grass, sitting on mm -hmm. the grass, eating garden food, and, and now everyone's in the tech, just immersed in the technological yeah. um, world. Um, do you have a, thoughts on, on how that how how the technology has kind of it sort of, sort of represents that same sort of mental um, um, runaway train? Mm -hmm. you, no, I, absolutely. I, I was extremely privileged in having that rural background because it did establish for me that spiritual connection to the rest of reality which I then built a career on in, in the technical world to be honest about it but because I need the analytic tools to, 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 to do this in the way that uh, is acceptable to the mainstream but the point is today I mean ch kids who are raised in cities uh, on television with their little digital devices and so on are just one step removed from the reality you see there's an interesting thing here in that in, in, in the biophysical sense, there's still as much a part of it as ever, but their mental processes are now in total disconnect. So they're not even aware of, of the profound dependence that they have on 
the sustainability of the ecosystems producing the food, the fish, the fiber, and so on and so forth, upon which we all depend. Uh, most young people have a sense that you know it's all produced in factories. I mean, that's what we are, this technological, mechanistic way of thinking about things. But uh, for all that, humankind is still a, a subsystem, you know, if you think in systems terms. We're just another species on the planet. Uh, we are a, a technological species, but our technology has served to alienate us from our actual biophysical reality. We could be using it to reunify us. You see, a city ought to be an ecosystem. A city ought to be a self-producing entity that adds to the total uh, stability of the planet. Instead of being a circular system in which everything is recycling, it tears from the countryside, processes it into stuff, produces enormous quantities of garbage, and then pumps it out into the oceans or into the atmosphere. So the way we've created cities because we have this mechanistic mindset with no connectivity to the rest of the world, the city becomes a linear throughput system, something through which material passes and is degraded and makes no contribution whatsoever to the integrity of the ecosphere. Whereas a natural ecosystem uses an enormous amount of material, but in such a way that each use of that material becomes a waste product useful to some other organism and then it recycles back through the whole system, starting with green plants, then through the bacteria and fungi and animals, back to the green plants, and over and over again. It's always fascinated me that there's only a fixed amount of biologically useful stuff on the planet, but it's been the same stuff in use over and over again for four billion years that's kept the whole thing going. And humans are busily dumping it all into the bottom of the sea or messing up the systems that produce it uh, simply because we've uh, lost contact with our roots in that whole system. We contaminate and poison the very system that has produced us. Pretty nasty business. Do we have the knowledge to create a city like that? I think we do. But again, it requires, first of all, recognition that this is something that is necessary. It re to me, you see, the fascinating thing is it's more challenging than the kind of mechanistic science that we do now, right? But you know, there may not be as much money in it. In a sense. I, I, one analogy that might work is to think of... You know, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but that's going to be a, a very terrible thing oh. and you're going to something very, very important here. It's probably going to go on for hours. I know. Do you want, do you want me to ask? Well, we no, can we can't really, too, we can't really we have to sit up there. Well, I don't want to take up all your day, that's for sure. Um, that's, you know um, let's, let's, let's go with it. Uh, that, that mic is pretty um, okay. it's pretty good at focusing sound. I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Do you know, do you remember where I left off? <laughs> yeah, well, I was going to say that one way of thinking um, uh, of a subsystem of a system is to think of production agriculture. That's commercial agriculture that you know, is producing these enormous quantities of genetically modified foods and so on and so forth, versus what we call agroecology. Okay. In experiments, the small number of people practicing agricultural ecology or ecological agriculture, they can produce as much food per unit area as these other guys. But there's no funds to support them mm -hmm. because the technical basis of agroecology is all in the mind. There are no pesticides, there are no fertilizers, there are no massive irrigation systems and so on, well, there might be that, but it would be engineered differently from what we do now. So where there's no opportunities to privatize, to trade, to create intellectual capital, nobody invests in it. Whereas over here, Monsanto, right, can manufacture and patent a pesticide. It can manufacture and patent a seed now. You know, imagine getting the permission to patent genetic material as if they actually created it. They modify it in ways that I think are questionable, but that's neither here nor there. The point is all the money and all the wealth creation in agriculture is in the uh, so-called production agriculture, the modern uh, high input conventional agriculture that happens to be a, a major problem in destroying the planet. Okay. Now, cities are the same. 
we have cities that are based on engineered systems and throughput systems and all sorts of uh, primitive, I, I mean primitive in the sense that they're Newtonian analytic mechanical ways of approaching the city. We don't approach the city as an ecosystem. We don't design it so that the water isn't contaminated. We don't design it so that it doesn't produce air pollution. We don't design it so that it it can produce a good portion of its own food base and so on and so forth. So the possibilities are there, but we haven't got the mindset to, to bring it off. I'm actually part of a group who are trying to think some of this stuff through. and. Uh, Perhaps it'll come someday, but it ain't happening right now, and uh, there are lots of good reasons for that. So, what 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 do you do, what do you experience in opposition from the media? What what what's what's the and, and politicians? Like, what's your experience in dealing with those with those uh, forces? I, I've had a number of media interviews that um, uh, the reporter I, I, should, I won't name them, but it, it was enormously enthusiastic about some of the things we talked about. Uh, phoned me two or three or four days later and said, I'm sorry, it's, it's all been nixed. Everything's on the cutting room floor. This was deemed too politically controversial. That was too difficult to understand, and so on and so forth. So I think the, the mainstream media are duplicitous in our downfall. There's almost a, uh, an active attempt to keep people in ignorance and, and not to raise the bar of understanding very high at all. So we have a, 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 you see, for democracy to work, you need a fully engaged, highly literate, well-educated population that takes an interest in the kinds of issues we're talking about. But we have a media that's designated uh, itself, well, first of all, it's part of the corporate mainstream, and it's dedicated to keeping people in abysmal ignorance about most important things. See, I, for one, am not much into sports, so, so I'm appalled at how items about the Olympics take precedence over, you know, a massacre in some place or other. Is that coming? Probably. Yeah, <laughs> it's all right, I'll go. She can see me through the windows. Yeah. So she's, well, you know, when you let her out, she'll just settle down on the floor, on the deck. See, she'll just... Sure. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, take that away. That would be a good idea. Yeah, that it would be. You know, it's, it's also what I'm coming to with my project, right? Like, I have no financing. I'm just yeah. doing all on my own. Well, that's it. Because, you know, the only money anywhere now is, is from advertising money, that's which right. is the exact people I'm trying to sort of <laughs> not give power to. You yeah, know what I exactly. mean? So it, it's tough. It's tough to do anything. And, and mainstream media is totally based on advertising dollars, right? If you let her go, she'll just go lie down somewhere. She may come and say hi mm -hmm. for a minute, then she'll get bored. Won't you? That was not very good, Milo. We don't like barky dogs. Okay. Hi, Milo. So uh, we, I think we've pretty much covered it. Yeah. Well, maybe Milo? I'd like to ask, what what keeps you inspired to to uh, to continue what you do? I mean, you're 69, <laughs> right? I mean, that's a that's a that's a that's a long time to be uh, as, as passionate and uh, dedicated to to spending your afternoons talking to people about <laughs> issues you obviously are committed to. I guess I have a sense of, uh, of commitment to, to what I'm doing, a sense of commitment to the planet, a sense of commitment to other human beings. I'm not one of those who, who despises people and hopes we all go down in, in a rush at all. I, I think we have enormous potential, even as a biologist. Look, we are the only species with what I call high intelligence, the capacity for uh, analytic logic based on evidence. We're the only species capable of looking ahead, planning forward, of designing a world that would actually work. We're the only species capable of extending, uh, making moral judgments. We're going to have to say this all over here. It's distracting for me and I'm sure it's coming through. Yeah, right? that, that will definitely be. Seems to go away for a second. Yeah. Is he? Runs around the house. Oh wow! No, but you were good. You went down there. That's what you should do. Sure. If if if, uh, if yeah, Dick Gage is uh, the response. Well, you know, yesterday there was a ten or thirty second commercial being filmed in the garage behind here. Oh yeah. My neighbor's garage. Yeah. There were every. Both this street, that street, and, and 42nd were loaded with vans and trucks. There were at least 200 people 
moseying around here. I've yeah. never seen. I thought it was yeah. some big feature. Oh, it was a 10 second yeah. Fiat commercial. Yeah. yeah, you know, the, the budget for that And they shut every, the whole neighborhood has oh, to shut yeah, down. Yeah, right? totally. Actually, you know, the, the, the most uh, intense commercials are, are car commercials. Mm -hmm. Because the lighting has to be perfect for a car. That, oh, that's yeah. the most intense lighting that you can have in a in a film. Is that right? That's why they, they their budget would finance my project for two years probably. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing about weekends. Hey, these motors like yeah, they yeah. continue. I know it. it drives me crazy. It does. I even have one. So yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't use it often enough to satisfy my neighbors. I mean, you don't get it. You don't have a push one. I do, you know, but it, when the grass is wet, I can't. Yeah. It just doesn't work. Yeah. I Frank, well, I'm letting my garden I think, fill out the whole place next year. Okay, I think we're good. <coughs> so I okay, Myla, can you go lie down somewhere, please? Go down there, Myla. Myla, no. Go down there. Go down. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Go down. So go pick, pick go down. Okay. What, what? I don't even know what we were oh, talking geez. about. <coughs> Where were we? Where were we? Um, what keeps them going? Yes. All right. Well, a number of things keep me going. One, one of them is, I suppose, a kind of natural optimism in, in, in human beings, for heaven's sakes. A confidence that at some point we'll wake up and pull pull this off. We're the only species that has high intelligence, the capacity to reason logically from available data. We're the only species that has the potential to plan ahead to actually create a future that works for us. We're the only species that is able to make moral judgments. We're not alone. <clears throat> well, we are almost alone, but some other species share the ability to be compassionate about other members of their own kind. But we can share that with other people and other species. So these are truly human potentials that, that put us at the upper end of the evolutionary tree, if you like, if you somewhat like to think that way. So I think these are untried potentials. They've only recently evolved in the human evolutionary sequence. And so far they've been overridden by our instincts, by our emotional responses, and so on and so forth. But nature keeps putting us to the test. Is this experiment in high intelligence and logic and moral judgment going to work or not? And this is another of those tests. So either we will rise to be fully human and exercise these higher abilities that no other species has or will be wiped out. It's just natural selection. It was an, a nice experiment. It failed. Uh, other species get along just fine, you know, through their instinctive and emotional responses. Maybe that's all humans were ever intended to be. I hope not and I'd like to see us rise to that challenge and I, I guess I'm part of attempting to, uh, to get us to wake up to rise to the potential that is there in every single human being, but that is stifled and repressed by our cultures and our societies. Cool. Ah, brilliant. Okay, thank you. I hope we, I hope we don't take everything with us. <laughs> cool. That's great. Thank okay. you very much.